Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me, man. <laughs> Very cool. Um, to start, I want to try to give you the understanding. I'm going to basically talk on two different levels. I'm going to talk about the existing model and the way you're getting the patients, how they're coming with the diagnoses, and basically why those diagnoses are pretty much all invalid, and what the physical presentation is that lets me know that, and then I'll explain how my method works. So most of the patients you get, they're gonna come to you referred by a doctor with the diagnosis, which would typically result from some sort of diagnostic test. Pretty much all the patients, I've been doing this for 23 years, I've seen like 15,000 people, now people come to me from all over the country, I go around the country. I pretty much have the gamut, I understand the concept. And basically, no doctor is taking time to talk or look or examine any, any patient. The typical method is, you get there, here's your prescription. In fact, when patients go, the three second time they spend with the doctor is simply to say, tell me where you would like an MRI. That's the way it's working. There's not even a discussion, it's just, I have to put down a place. So there are people who will say, well, I have pain in my back, my neck, my shoulder, my knee. They're like, I don't care. Just tell me which one you want me to put down to give you the diagnosis for the MRI. So the MRI comes and it finds structural variations, right? Everyone acknowledges that. Herniated disc, stenosis, arthritis, meniscal tears, spondylolisthesis, compression fractures, all of it. And here's the dilemma. The premise is based on the idea that you're having symptoms, the structural variation is found, therefore a correlation is created. The structural variation is creating the symptom. That is the primary premise by which the MRI has been perpetuated for 40 years. The problem is it's completely invalid. You're using correlative theory. And correlative theory says simply the fact that since this is here and this is here, this must be causing this. And the way I try to present an understanding of how invalid that is, is I can say we could just be standing at this door and just as the sun rises, I open the door. Tomorrow, just as the sun rises, I open the door. Next day, just as the sun rises, I open the door. I can now say me opening the door causes the sun to rise. That's correlative theory. It's junk science, right? There was never a study that was done that proved the MRI was identifying the causes of pain. That was never done. And in fact, by 1994, the first study was done on people who had no back pain. And that showed that 70% of those had bulging or herniated discs. It's gone farther and farther along. I'm not the only person who's saying it's invalid. There's multitudes of studies. So there was a study that showed that over the age of 60, 90% of people who have no back pain have bulging or degenerative discs, 90%. You can see that from that perspective, there's, that's considered a 90% false positive. The structural variation will be identified without the symptom. 2007, American College of Physicians does a 20-year literature search on those people suffering from back pain, and they find that 85% of people who don't, uh, who have back pain, cannot have their pain attributed to a spinal abnormality like a herniated disc or stenosis. 85% who have back pain. That's an 85% false negative. You have the symptom, but we can't identify it to a structural variation. So we're looking at a 90% false positive and an 85% false negative. Where's the correlation? There's none, no, it's ridiculous, it's retarded. It, it, it's, it was simply made up 40 years ago and has been allowed to perpetuate. I'll take it from a theoretical basis. Patient starts getting pain two weeks ago, right? They go, they get the MRI, it finds stenosis. Oh, the cause of your pain is stenosis. By definition, that means two weeks ago I started having pain, you're telling me it's from stenosis, two weeks and one day ago, I didn't have stenosis. Does that even remotely make sense to anybody? Stenosis is a progressive disease entity. It takes years to develop. Clearly, it was there before. You could look at arthritis, all these type things. So what's going on is a false mechanism, which is simply to say, I always take the MRI when you're having your symptom. 
Therefore, the structural variation is found while you're having a symptom. Therefore, I'll simply make the correlation. It's pure, unadulterated insanity. It's insanity. You want to look at beyond that. Let's go beyond that. Let's look at studies on surgeries of structures that have been identified as the cause of pain. One of the most classic ones is on the idea of knee pain being caused by arthritis. All the people in the study had knee arthritis. All the people in the study had knee pain. They're broken up into three groups. One gets a debridement. One gets a lavage, a little washing. The other gets a mock surgery. Zero difference. Zero difference in the ability to reduce pain. The conclusion of the author of the study was arthritis doesn't cause pain. Right? Another one. This, from well, what I understood, was actually based on a study from the company that makes the cement that's used to um, fill compression fractures because supposedly compression, compression fractures cause back pain. So they do a study, 200 people, all have compression fractures, all have back pain, half are broken up, they get the injection of the cement, the other gets nothing, mock surgery, no difference. They were stunned, stunned by the results, exactly the same clearly indicating compression fractures don't create the symptom. So you can kind of look at, from a scientific perspective, the studies are overwhelming. From a theoretical perspective, you can't tell me that a symptom that began a week ago could be caused by something that takes years to generate, and you can't justify the fact that a week and a day ago that I didn't have that structural variation. So as you go through the process, you start to see that the only thing that's going on is that if you're over 50, you have a structural variation. No, no, no. I don't care if you have blonde hair or brown hair. I don't care if you're six foot. I don't care if you have blue eyes. You got structural variations. And the only thing that's going on is you happen to be taking the diagnostic test when you're having your symptom. And there's the correlation. And it's completely invalid, 100%. So that has been the progression. So I graduate in 1993. I go to medical school, you know, the physical therapy school, and kind of instantly, I got a sense what they were saying just didn't make sense. And I'll give you kind of one of the best examples of what happened. This is right at the time when I was in school. My father plays tennis, and every Saturday, right after he plays tennis, he comes in the door like this. Every week, same thing. Walks in like that. Riding pain in the back, goes to the doctor, gets the MRI, herniated disc. So I'm this student just entering physical therapy school, and I think I got a concept of what's happening. And I take my anatomy class and my kinesiology class, and I learned that the hip flexor, when contracted on one side, makes you stand like this. So I said, that sounds interesting, it kind of sounds similar look similar. I said to my father, do you mind? I, I'm just some student. This guy's giving him this $1,800 MRI. He's not turning it. I said, do you mind? I just, can I just press on your hip flexor a second? I just want to see what happens. So I find his hip flexor and massage it out. Bam, stands up straight. No pain. We do it a couple of weeks in a row and we're like, wait a second. <laughs> Something's different. I'm not thinking it's the herniated disc. I'm thinking it's the hip flexor. And so the process began in my early stages. I also had been lifting weights for about three and a half years, and um, I have this weird ability that I can kind of understand force vectors and things, so I kind of taught myself the biomechanics and physics of weightlifting. So an example of that would be um, you could go to a gym, and so people do lat pull down, and they'll say, what's the right place for my hands? And everyone will say, well, you need to do it wide to get a certain part of the muscle, and then you want to do it narrow to get another part. And then I just started applying force vectors. And the force vector concept is that, well, when you're doing a lat pull down, which way would the force be pulling? Up, right? The, you're pulling it down. It's going to try to pull you directly up, right? Well, what would be the way you can apply the greatest amount of force to a vertical force vector? Directly down, right? If your hands are out wide and you're pulling, you can see that my arms, my forearms aren't straight down. They're actually coming in which means there's a bit of a translatory force. Some of my force is not just being pulled down, it's being pulled in. So I'm losing some of the force. So I suddenly recognized, well, the answer to the question is, 
when my forearms are perpendicular to the ground, that's when I have the optimal ability to pull against the force. So it's that kind of understanding that I was really thinking about muscle in a, in a way that I, that combined with some of these other things, classic example would be like someone saying they're having pain here and they're being told it's from a nerve root impingement. And, you know, I press on the levator scapula and they'd be like, boom, wow, I can move my neck. It's incredible. And, you know, it's just like the evidence, the physical evidence becomes overwhelming. And this is all happening while I'm in medical school. So I said, you know what? I just can't do it like this. I can't follow your methods. I'm going to try to figure it out myself. And so I'll give you a kind of a coolish massage story. So I'm a student in my last affiliation. And this lady, Kathy, she gets an ACL reconstruction. Well, it didn't go so well. She has this massive amount of thickening around her knee. And I don't know, it just seemed logical to me. I try to break the thickening up because I'm assuming that's limiting her symptom, you know, lim limiting her range of motion. So I massage it. And all of a sudden, next, she, she, next day she comes back and it's like black and blue. It really looks bad. And the owner of the company comes to me, pulls me in the room and says, don't you ever do that again. If you're gonna massage, you just massage the surface. It's just supposed to feel good. We're really not trying to accomplish anything. It's just, you know, you're just kind of doing something to make the person feel gratified. <laughs> and so I go back to Kathy and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that to you. Does it hurt? And she says, don't tell anybody this, but I can move my knee more than I ever have before. I can move it 30, 40 degrees more. I want you to do it again. I'm like, you're crazy. Did you see what it looks like? And she's like, I'm telling you, I'm the patient. I want you to do that again. Well, I massage it out, and over the period of time I treat this lady, she ends up being pain-free, fully functional, no symptom. And so I kind of went, now, I went back to school at 30 years old. This was a second career for me, so I'm a little older. Um, you know, I had a lot of life experience. I had some logical understanding. So my attitude was, if no one's around to tell me what to do, <laughs> I'm going to just try and do it on my own and figure it out. I'm going to do whatever I think I should be doing. So... Things started just falling into place. And I'll give you like one of the whoppers, the things that I guess I have taken this on to such an emotional level because of the fact that as a result of, I mean, certainly the PBS special and some of these books, like this last book actually was published by Hay House, which is the second largest publisher in the world. The book is actually published here, Canada, England, Australia, and India, and South Africa. 